Let's start this morning's message uh, with some interaction. I need a little participation from you. Uh, Just quickly, uh, by a show of hands, how many of us have ever made a wrong turn? Ever made a wrong turn when you've been on a road trip or traveling somewhere? Uh, I suspect there are probably a few wives sort of giving the elbow to their husbands, uh, not just because of the many wrong turns that you husbands maybe have made, but probably because of the stubbornness or constant refusal uh, to ask for directions in those kinds of situations. I'm, I'm sure most of us can relate, you know, to the idea of making a wrong turn a time or two. Uh, if you were with us last week, actually, for, for our Easter service, our, our teaching pastor, Mike Krause, he shared a story of a time when he and some buddies, they made a pretty severe wrong turn on the side of a mountain, and it nearly cost them their lives. It was a pretty dramatic story. And uh, I don't think most of us will make that big of, of a screw-up uh, in that kind of situation, but, you know, we all have these stories of when we've We've made wrong turns and the consequences that resulted. I know uh, for our family, uh, just a few months ago, uh, we were, went on a short road trip a few days away uh, to Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Dutch country, which is obviously a wild and hot vacation, vacation destination in the winter. Uh, but we were going there for a couple of days with our kids and with my parents. And uh, my parents are actually driving in this case. And uh, when they drive and we travel together, they prefer to take the scenic route. They like the scenic route rather than uh, the direct route on the highways. And uh, this is definitely uh, one of the ways in which we were differentiated on the the genogram. Uh, But we were on the scenic route and uh, we were actually following a GPS. But I don't know if the GPS got interrupted when we got into sort of Amish country and it it couldn't penetrate the sort of the no hydro zone. But we got way off the beaten trail and uh, felt like we were going in circles on these gravel roads, passing Amish farmhouse after Amish farmhouse. And uh, you parents know uh, that there's nothing better than what is normally going to be a six or seven hour road trip uh, turning into a nine or ten hour road trip with three small kids uh, trapped in the van. But all that to say, uh, we know what it feels like to make a wrong turn. We uh, have had experiences where we need to, to reroute or course correct. And today we're launching a brand new series, a series called Only God. And uh, the subtitle, or the theme for this series is Four Point Turn. Four Point Turn, because we're going to look at uh, four turns or or life adjustments over the next four weeks uh, that we need to make if we're going to open ourselves up to a growing and thriving relationship with God. Sort of four postures or orientations we need to have if we're going to experience the life that God wants for us, all that he wants to do in relating to us. And something that is, is kind of cool about this series, about this next month is in our church, is that for the entire month, we're going to focus on a single verse, a single passage of scripture that, that the series is built on. And there's going to be four lessons or four uh, practices that we're going to learn to open ourselves up to a deeper relationship with God. And so since we're focusing on this single verse, uh, we want to be able to really learn it together as a community, uh, internalize it, maybe even memorize it, So its truths can be deeply impressed on our hearts and our minds. So to help us do that, uh, we're going to say this verse a few times together throughout the series. So as we get started today, I want to first read it for you to introduce you to it. And then we're actually going to say it all together. We're going to say it out loud all together as a community. So uh, first let me introduce to you our verse for this series. It's from 2 Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14 where it says this. It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. All right, so that's, that's our poster verse for this entire Only God series. And now in all of our locations, whether I'm with you live or via video, we're going to say this out loud together, loud enough so our neighbor can hear it, so we really get familiar with this verse. So let's say this all together. Follow my lead. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. All right, very good. Give yourselves a pat on the back. That's sort of the first step to getting to know this verse together. 
And uh, if you're the type of person that has a personal sticker chart at home for all of your sort of life's greatest achievements, feel free to go home and put a gold star on your sticker chart as we have starting to get to know our memory verse. Now, to give you a sense uh, for why we would choose uh, to build this entire series on this passage of scripture, uh, we need to know a bit of the context uh, for the story that, that this scripture comes from so that we can have the backdrop for why we would sort of focus on it for the rest of this series. And we actually feel like this verse relates significantly to, to our time and our culture and our lives. So to help us understand sort of where this verse comes from and why, why it's important, let me give you a, a bit of the background. Uh, in the story of the scriptures, in, in the Old Testament, in the Bible, uh, early on, God identifies the nation of Israel as his unique and chosen people. Sort of, he calls them out as his people, and he actually rescues them from slavery at the hand of the Egyptians. And God, as he, he leads them out of slavery, he makes a covenant with the nation of Israel. And we've talked about covenants uh, from time to time around here. It's, it's kind of this special promise. Uh, it's this capital P promise that God made with Israel. He made a promise to be their God, to lead them, to guide them, to relate to them, and ultimately to bless them in such a way so that uh, all of the surrounding nations and the whole rest of the world would know who God is and what it means to relate to them. He wanted to sort of use them as this conduit to show the world what it looks like to live life with God. God made a promise to them that if they would remain faithful to him and relate to him in this sort of only God kind of way, that they would experience the fullness of life that comes from him. And at first... Uh, this went very well as God sort of established uh, Israel as his people. They made this covenant and uh, they sort of oriented their lives around him, let him be the leader of their lives, sort of increased uh, their influence as a nation, and they experienced a, a rich and tangible relationship with God. But over time, what happened as, as Israel sort of began to experience the prosperity and the well-being and the blessing that God sort of put into their lives, from their newfound freedom and identity as, as a people, they began to actually start to feel independent and a little bit self-sufficient. They grew somewhat complacent with their relation, in their relationship with God. Kind of began to feel like God was no longer as necessary as he used to feel. They began to pursue things that they wanted to sort of pursue all on their own, following their own selfish ambitions and desires. And God was no longer central to their lives. You know, it's, it's very interesting how uh, when life is going well, uh, when things feel sort of all as they should be, or uh, the trajectory of our lives feels like it's just kind of up and to the right, it's amazing how in those kinds of situations, it's easy for God to feel unnecessary. What's even more fascinating, though, is that God anticipated that his people might feel this way when it came to relating to him. And almost a thousand years earlier than uh, when the book of Chronicles was written, the verse that we're focusing on, God gave his people this warning in the, the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 10 to 14, God said this to his people before he led them into the promised land. He said, when you have eaten your fill, be sure to praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. But that is the time to be careful. Be, beware that in your plenty you do not forget the Lord your God. For when you have become full and prosperous and have built fine homes to live in, when your flocks and herds have become very large and your silver and gold have multiplied along with everything else, be careful. Do not become proud at that time and forget the Lord your God who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. You know, as God had led Israelites into the promised land. They began to enjoy their fill, live in this prosperity and blessing, you know, build fine homes and stockpile their wealth, pile up sort of the silver and gold. They began to forget who actually led them there in the first place, who actually was their guide bringing them there. They began to pay less attention to the commands and instructions that God had given them. They began to come become proud, proud in their hearts of who they were and what they felt like they had accomplished, now feeling as though they had done it all on their own. And they essentially began living life without God. As the story unfolds, their life without God begins to unravel 
into destructive choices and disastrous consequences. Till eventually the, the entire nation is divided and its leaders are dethroned and the people of Israel were actually captured by a foreign nation and brought into exile and, and essentially left abandoned, having lost their influence, lost their identity and lost their way as the people of God. And that's where we find ourselves. That's where Israel found itself when we pick up the story of Chronicles. See, Chronicles is actually a, a retelling of Israel's history, sort of a retelling of the story that I just described. But it was written while they found themselves in exile. And instead of sort of a history book designed to answer the question, how did we get here? This retelling of Israel's history was more intended to answer the question, how do we get out of here? How do we get out of this mess? How do we reclaim the life with God we once had? Where do we turn? Because there was that time when God was at the center of their lives. There was that time when their lives were totally oriented around him, letting him be the leader of their community. And the early chapters of 2 Chronicles, they actually describe those good old days. Good old days of life with God. And, and it describes uh, the crowning of King Solomon at that time. King Solomon was the son of the famous King David. And he was ultimately the wealthiest and wisest leader the nation had ever had. And under King Solomon's leadership, out of their love and devotion and submissiveness to God, he led the entire community to, to take their time and their, their energy and their resources to construct a temple so that they could honor and worship the Lord. And so they could symbolically establish his presence among them. And at, in that situation, the, the results that are recorded are, are joy and wonder sense of unity in the community and, and a strong hope and security because of God's undeniable, undeniable presence in their community and their unquestionable need for him. But when we find ourselves in the story of Chronicles, sort of where we pick things up, the temple had long since been destroyed and their current situation in exile was such a stark contrast to the good old days life with God. And now it felt like God's presence was absent. So it's in response to these desperate circumstances in the midst of this exile that we hear God say once again from 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. That's where we want to focus our attention this morning. That's the, the first turn we must make. Then he says, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Then I will be able to come into their lives uh, and be God the way that God wants to be God, bringing healing and restoration. So as we bring uh, this story closer to home, as we bring it out of Israel's story and into our story, and we consider sort of our time in history, our part of the world, sort of how we go about our day-to-day -day lives, I think we find ourselves in a very different and yet, at the same time, a very similar situation to the community of Israel. You know, we, we generally don't find ourselves in this sort of physical or political state of exile, you know, impoverished and under a, an outside oppressive authority. That's not really the, the situation that we live in, in our culture, in our day and age. You know, rather, we live in a culture of excess and abundance, and we have uh, pretty much everything we need right at our fingertips. And we live in a culture of extreme freedom and opportunity. We can generally say what we want to say, do what we want to do, go where we want to go. We've got lots of choices and options in front of us. And we also live in a society that actually encourages and celebrates the self-made individual, the person that can kind of make it on their own, do whatever it takes to rise to the top. And yet that is quite similar to the kind of situation that Israel was in at the apex of their kingdom, in those good old days when they began to make the subtle but severe shift to forgetting their need for God. And so I think we can relate to this story on two levels. Number one is that for us today as Christians, even as people generally interested in pursuing a relationship with God, because of the culture of abundance that we live in, it can be so easy for us to go about most of our lives not really feeling a need for him. And secondly, I think we can relate to this story, um, not because we find ourselves in a physical state of exile, but I wonder how many of us 
I wonder how many of us are wandering through life and especially our life of faith, feeling like we're in a spiritual state of exile. Feeling as though we don't even really know what it means to relate to God on a personal level. Feeling like God is is distant, God is intangible, not really relevant to my day-to-day life. And I think many of us are missing out on the, the intimacy that we could experience with him, intimacy that's available through Christ, the empowerment by his spirit to transform our lives and bring us meaning and purpose, and ultimately to have a relationship with him that is growing and thriving and active day by day, moment by moment. So this morning, and at the beginning of this series, We have a choice to make. If we can relate to that, we have a choice to make and an opportunity to turn our hearts toward God. To turn our hearts maybe to him for the first time, the first time in a long time. To come back to him and allow him to be our God to a greater degree. And to respond to the invitation that God gave Israel in that circumstance and that he's giving us today. And it all starts with humbling ourselves before him. Coming with a humble posture and a humble attitude. You know, in some ways, I think this may uh, seem uh, simple, may seem obvious. You know, if God is God, of course, you know, we as people need to have a humble posture before him. But like so many things in the Christian faith and in seeking to follow Jesus, what seems simple often isn't easy. Because I think our struggle with humility can be one of the greatest stumbling blocks in our relationship with God. So this morning, I want to give us two main points, two main takeaways to help us figure out what does it even mean to grow in humility? What does it mean for us as individuals and as a community to humble ourselves before God? And the first thing we need to do, if we're going to be able to do that, is to root out the pride that exists deep within our hearts. We need to root out the pride that is deep within our hearts. Now again, that kind of seems simple or obvious if we're, you know, striving for humility that we have to sort of get rid of the pride. And and I don't think that most of us are living with an overtly sort of arrogant or or cocky attitude towards God. But I do feel like, and I've sort of seen in my own life, that there's a lot of pride that lingers beneath the surface of, of my heart. And it's even been argued that all of the things that are are sin, that are sort of the destructive habits and behaviors that get in the way of our relationship with God and sort of break down our relationships with other people, it all stems from a deep-seated pride where we sort of inherently believe that life should revolve around us, that we know best, that we should get our way, and it makes little room for God to be in the picture. In uh, James chapter 4, verses 6 to 8, it says this about a proud heart. It says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. His love and grace can flow into the humble heart. So humble yourselves before God. Draw near to God and God will draw near to you. Now God doesn't want to oppose a proud heart. God doesn't want to oppose any of us. God loves us. He sees us as his kids, his creation, and he deeply longs uh, to be in relationship with us, to pursue a relationship with us. But when it comes to how God relates to us, like a a friend of mine once said that the way God relates is, is like a gentleman. He's not seeking to impose himself on us. He's not seeking to force himself into our lives, but rather he's looking for us to just open up space in our lives. And the pride that exists in our hearts, it's kind of like this, this shut off valve to a life with God. It sort of closes the valve and we need to come humbly to open that valve so that God's life and his grace and his love can can flow in and through us. So to help us imagine and sort of look at our own lives, assess our own lives to to understand the degree to which pride is sort of getting the best of us, I have three scenarios I want to share with us that I've been thinking about this week that I think are good litmus tests or indicators of the degree to which pride is at play in our lives. Uh, The first is based on our willingness to ask, ask for help. How how willing are you to ask for help when you need it? Earlier this week, as I was thinking about this message, uh, I had thrown out a question on Facebook, asking people to share uh, their most humbling life experiences. And a number of people shared uh, some really uh, profound uh, stories, really incredible stories of sort of coming in contact with our appropriate smallness in the world. 
But there was kind of this theme that emerged among some of these ideas that people shared. And the theme was that when people found themselves in situations where they just desperately had to depend on others, they desperately needed help, it was incredibly humbling. Whether they were dealing with health issues or a financial crisis, parenting struggles or, or job loss, finding themselves in a situation of needing a place to stay for a period of time. Now, one person even shared a situation where uh, their luggage was lost when they were, they were moving to another part of the country. And for a few weeks, they had, depend, had to depend on total strangers for all of their stuff. And when we find ourselves in these kinds of circumstances, uh, it is incredibly humbling. And usually we don't like it because we want to be in control. We want to know that we can get by on our own. And that's the pride that sort of exists deep within us. But when we allow ourselves to receive help, it sort of chips away that pride. And I think that opens us up to being willing to seek God's help in our lives as well. The second litmus test uh, I'll share with you, it's kind of related to our willingness to ask for help. It's our ability to take correction. How well do you uh, receive correction when, when you need to be corrected in some aspect of your life? A couple of weeks ago, as I was preparing some of the material uh, for this series, uh, actually specifically uh, the surveys that we're distributing each and every week that I I think have already been mentioned, uh, that we're going to hope to have everyone in our community respond to to help us understand how well you're tracking with our Sunday services and and provide us some feedback on how we can make them more effective at sort of fostering uh, this life and relationship with God. A couple of weeks ago, as I was, I was preparing those surveys, you know, we'd put in a bunch of work. I'd share them with, with our team. I was feeling pretty good about them. Um, and someone in our team recommended that uh, we get an opinion of some experts in our community, some people who have a lot of experience in the field of, of survey debel- development and been doing that in the, the world of, of academia. I thought, hey, we should get some of their feedback before we finalize this thing. So I thought that was a good idea. I sent it off to them and kind of felt like, you know, we had done a good job. These things were in a good place. Um, And there might just be a few tweaks. You know, I I had actually studied a bit of survey development when I was in university and thought, you know, these things were in good shape. But what I found as I've got some some feedback was that these surveys needed a lot of help. Some of the questions were kind of confusing. There was a lot of redundancy. You know, they weren't necessarily going to be clear for people to answer. They probably weren't going to give us uh, data that would help us make sort of effective or, or helpful decisions. And, you know, I I at first wanted to get defensive. I first wanted to protect what I had done because I'd invested a lot of time and effort. And I thought it was pretty good. But it was quite humbling and, frankly, quite helpful to sit down with one of these folks from our our community. They spent an hour with me, taught me some great lessons about survey development and question asking, and ultimately improved the quality of these surveys so that they can be more effective in sort of the health of our church family. You know, our ability to take correction is a good indicator of the degree to which pride is at play. And I know that can be a struggle for me where I want to sort of get defensive and protect work that I've done. But it's important to allow ourselves to get corrected when we, can, when we can do better, when we can grow. So how do you do with that in your workplace? You know, when you receive correction from your boss, maybe in your, your family, you know, when a spouse needs to, to correct you in some way, maybe from a teacher or a coach, maybe even a pastor, I think all of these things are illustrative of how well we'll also receive correction from God. Third litmus test will give us sort of engaging the pride in our lives has to do with how we respond to success and failure. These things are all kind of interrelated, but you know, when you experience success in your life, do you aim to sort of point the spotlight, make sure the spotlight is shining brightly on you, that everybody notices you get all the credit that you feel that you deserve, Do you self-promote, you know, on Facebook or just make sure everybody's aware of your latest and greatest achievement? Or when you experience success, when things go well, do you try to redirect some of that credit? Do you try to point to other people who played a role in what you achieved? Do you give some of that credit to God, you know, thanking him for the doors that he opened, the opportunities that he gave you? That's sort of the difference between a proud heart and a humble heart. And similarly, when you experience failure in in your life, when you mess up and make mistakes, because we we all do that, you know, are you quick to blame, get angry? Or are you quick to apologize, to ask for forgiveness, to ask how you can do better next time? All of these things are reflective of the degree to which pride is at work in our hearts. And if we're going to humble ourselves before God, we need to be rooting that out. And it's, it's a process. We need to be attentive to it. 
need to pray about it. We need to ask others to speak into it. But it's the first step in humbling ourselves before God. The second, things we, second thing we need to do if we're going to sort of open this valve to a deeper relationship with God is we need to recognize our need for him in every way. We need to recognize our need for God in every, every aspect of our lives. You know, if you think about your daily life, your sort of ordinary routines, to what degree do you live as though you actually need God? To what degree does your life demonstrate sort of this I need God way of life? Or to help us think about this, let me ask the question a different way. If God suddenly didn't exist, if God suddenly sort of up and disappeared from your life, would anybody notice? You know, would anyone look at your life and feel like something has drastically changed? Would you even notice? A few years ago, uh, a pastor by the name of Craig Rochelle, he's from the United States, uh, he described a spiritual condition that he called practical atheism. Practical atheism, which essentially means declaring a belief in God, but living as though he doesn't exist. Declaring a belief in God, but living as though he doesn't exist. Living in such a way that if God suddenly up and disappeared, nothing would really change. It's an atheism, not of belief, but an atheism of action. And I think this is one of the most dangerous traps uh, that we can fall into in our 21st century North American Christianity. Because it's a situation not all that different from sort of the high point of Israel's success as a nation, where they began to forget that they really needed God. So as you think about your own life, consider how much much do you need God? Are you living with an I need God mentality or an I don't need God mentality? You know, when it comes to your sense of of entitlement, do you kind of feel like everything you've achieved and experienced and, and attained in life is because of you, because of what you've done, because of your strengths, your skills? Or do you recognize that God has played a massive role And you didn't choose where you were born or the family you were born into or the time and the place, you know, certain job offers or coaches or teachers you had along the way. As well, when it comes to living an I need God sort of way of life, do you spend time in prayer throughout your day? Do you spend time coming to God, bringing him requests, asking him to intervene, asking him for his will to be done and sort of what he wants for your life? Or do you kind of coast through, not really feeling like prayer is all that necessary unless you're in a major crisis or tragedy? Do you look to God's word for direction? Especially when you're making important life decisions of how to handle your finances or your budget, you know, where you should live or work or go to school, who you should date or who you might marry. Do you look for God's wisdom and influence and and seek uh, that influence from others who you know will provide a a God-honoring perspective? Or do you just go with your gut, kind of go your own way, assuming you know best or just making sure you want to sort of get your way no matter what and leaving God out of the picture? You know, the the I need God way of life also appreciates the degree to which we need God to transform us. When you think about your character, your attitudes, how you treat other people, do you feel sort of a desperate need for God's grace and forgiveness because you know you've screwed up, you know you haven't always loved people the way you should? And are you longing for God to transform you, to make you more into his likeness, into his image? Or do you think you're just fine, sort of have it all together, don't really need much for change? Ultimately, uh, this is what the rest of this series is all about. It's about learning to live an I need God way of life as a community. Learning to de- depend on him in prayer. We're going to talk about that next week learning to seek God's face, seek his direction, pursue him with our whole hearts, learning to turn from our destructive habits and choices and ultimately to pursue God's ways so that we can be empowered by him. We can experience an intimate relationship with him so that day by day we can know how to actually interact with him and experience sort of the transformation that comes along with that. This series is all about Uh, allowing God to be God so that our relationship with him can grow and even thrive. And that's what I want for us. That's the journey we want to head out, head on together over the course of the next month. You know, when it comes to my own life and uh, the kind of course correction that I've needed at times in my life of faith, uh, there's been seasons in my life, kind of a number of years ago, I would, would have found myself living 
as though I had this whole thing figured out. So that I had sort of a life of faith down to a T. And in fact, I, I even believed that that's what a life of faith was, that you kind of had to have all the right answers to all the right questions. You know, had to know how to orchestrate your life so that as other people looked at it, you know, they'd say, oh yeah, that guy's got it together. You know, he's got life with God all figured out. When I lived this way, you know, I began to feel like my relationship with God became pretty dry and thin because there wasn't, I had very little sense of a need for prayer. Very little sense of making sort of space in my day for God. Because, you know, I thought I had my act together. You know, when I was living this way, you know, this is so far from the example that Christ set for us. You know, Jesus came to earth and, and though he was God, though he had full access to all of the supernatural power that comes from God, he chose to be human. He chose to demonstrate to us what it looks like to depend on our heavenly father every day, moment by moment. And and when you look at Jesus's life in the scriptures, you see all kinds of times where he just needs to get away from the crowds, get away from the noise, to be with God, to pray and to listen and to just spend time with his heavenly father out of a love and devotion to him. You know, thankfully, uh, in recent years in my life, God's been stretching my heart and sort of growing my relationship with him, specifically through just having a quiet time every day. Spending time with him every day, for a few minutes in the morning or the evening or throughout the day. And it's amazing how that rejuvenates our life with God. And it's something that's so necessary for us. And I hope that can be a takeaway for us this morning. But specifically, in in some things I've been reading recently, uh, some talks I've been listening to, Uh, there's been some practices that I've been trying to include in my relationship with God. And one of them has been just coming before God in silence. Actually trying to quiet sort of all the noise in my life because in our busy lives and all the things that we pursue, you know, there's so much external noise and distraction. And what I found is that even when we shut off some of the external noise, we find ourselves in a quiet place. There's so much noise inside of us. You know, our to-do list, our agenda that we sort of need to complete, our fears, our worries, our struggles, the comparisons that we're constantly making against other people, or simply all of the things that we wish God was doing differently in our lives, all the things we want to sort of push onto God. But I've been learning to sort of cut through that noise. I've been learning to allow God to cut through that noise and to be quietly present with him, to allow him to be God and allow him to nudge my heart however he wants to do so. As we've learned some lessons this morning uh, from the story of Israel, what's kind of neat is that uh, this lesson was also shared by King Solomon at the end of his life. So he was reflecting on his life and the plight of his kingdom in some of the ways that over time he sort of veered the community away from God. He wrote a book called Ecclesiastes where he imparted his wisdom on to us. He says this in Ecclesiastes chapter five, sort of the posture we should have when we approach our relationship with God. He says, guard your steps when you go to the house of God, when you come into the presence of God. Go near to listen. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God, knowing usually those things come from our self-centeredness. Because God is in heaven and you are on earth. So let your words be few. As we close this morning, uh, we want to come to God in that posture, in that spirit. I think it's one of the the best ways we can represent a humble posture before God. So I want to invite the band to the stage and all of our locations. The band can come up and sort of get, get settled. And before we go, they're going to, they're going to lead us in a a closing song that's going to help us express as a community, our desperate need for God going to allow us to draw a line in the sand at the beginning of this month, beginning of this series, saying, God, we want to turn to you. We want to pursue you. We want to open the valve of our hearts for more of your life to flow into us. But before we sing together, we want to just sit in silence for a moment. We want to just be quiet before God, letting our words be few and letting him be God. I know it can be a bit strange to to sit sort of in pure silence, especially in a room with with a bunch of other people. And I know your mind is probably going to wander when we take some moments in silence. Mine will too. But I invite you just to bring yourself back to the simple phrase of saying, God, I need you. God, I need you. 
I want to humble myself before you. I want you to be more active in my life. And for a minute, we'll just be quiet saying, God, I need you. And allowing him to speak to us and to nudge our hearts however he wants to do this morning. So in a moment, I'm going to invite us to sort of bow our heads, close our eyes. I'm going to say a brief prayer. And then we'll just spend a moment in silence together. So would you bow with me as we pray? God, we admit uh, that there are many times in our lives where we turn off course in our relationship with you. So many things that, that tempt us uh, in our culture, in our day and age to sort of be distracted from you and, and not have you at the center of our lives. And as a result, we miss out on the goodness and the blessing and the healing and the restoration that you long to bring. You don't want us just coasting in our life with you, but you, you want us to experience a deep, intimate, interactive relationship with you. So at the beginning of this series, we want to sort of set that tone and set that expectation, God, that that's what we're striving for. We're turning to you and asking that you would be God in our lives because we desperately need you. So right now we quiet our hearts before you. We open ourselves up to you, just saying, God, we need you. And we ask that you would speak to our hearts and just be very present with us right now in the way that only you can. And we pray and we can experience all of this because of Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen.